Green, 54, Bishop Whipple, Woolen Mill, Pike. I'm Samuel Temple. And I'm Logan Ledman. This month on 1855, in case you haven't figured it out, we'll be talking about athletic legend Bruce Smith. Bruce was the only Minnesota Gopher to ever win a Heisman and was born right here in Faribault. Well, well not right here, but in, in, Fer in Faribault. Turns out that the exact place where someone who lived in the 1930s was born isn't information you can find on Wikipedia. However, you can find out that his nickname was Boo. Fun fact. But what was really scary about Bruce Smith was his athletic talent. In high school, he played golf and Mr. football. Mr. 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 Why don't we let Bruce Crinky say that? Okay. We spoke with Bruce Crinky, a chair member of the Bruce Smith Golf Committee, about Bruce Smith's life. Geez, there's way too many Bruces. He was a three-sport athlete. He went to uh, Faribault High School, and I know in his senior year, he played football, obviously. He was on the golf team, also on the basketball team. And then that uh, probably was a little unusual, a three-sport athlete back then but he was a very gifted athlete. Bruce Smith's athletic prowess wasn't the result of some freak accident involving a radioactive Heisman winner bite. He was raised in a gopher-centric house. His father, Lucius Smith, had a college football career of his own. Long before the Vikings duked it out with the Packers, the Minnesota Gophers duked it out with a different neighboring state. In the same way Medford and Bethlehem Academy have the battle for the paddle, the Minnesota Gophers sought over possession of the little brown jug from Michigan. Holy Exposition Batman, now on to the story. The year is 1910. Lucius Smith is playing defense for the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Only one touchdown was scored in that game, but that was all it took for the Wolverines to win. The legend states that the point was scored on Lucius's end. He vowed then and there that if he had a son, he would play for Minnesota and take back the win that was rightfully his. He later denied the story. Was graduating from Fairbo in 38, 39. It would have been uh, shortly after that when he went to the university and played at, at the U. He was a running back, but in, at the University of Minnesota, he was a running back. He played defense, too, because a lot of them played both ways, and he was the punter of the Gophers as well. I think as a running back, I mean, he obviously when you play defense as well, but I think offensively as a running back, that was the, the formation that he liked to run out of and was best known for. Uh, at the university. I think if you were to talk to Bruce Smith today, he said Bernie Buhn. Bernie was the coach at the university at the time, and he was the one that uh, is well known, well respected to this day, and uh, molded his career, helped him along, and made him probably what he was as a great running back. Some call it the most important play of Bruce Smith's career. Some call it the most important play in the history of the Minnesota Gophers. It's safe to say it was important. What was it? Well, on November 9th, 1940, the sky was churning with Midwestern precipitation, turning the field below into a muddy, slippery mess. Minnesota was undefeated and was facing off against their ultimate rivals, the also undefeated Michigan Wolverines. When the first half neared an end, the Wolverines held a 6-0 lead. With less than five minutes on the clock, Bruce was called into the huddle. With a synchronicity like that of a skilled ballet dancer, Bruce and the other halfback, George Frank, pull off a genius play that tricked the Wolverines into not noticing that Bruce had the ball. By the time they realized that Bruce was heading up left end, he was already dead set on getting to his destination. With a good block, some dodges, and a triumphant sprint, Bruce had made the 80-yard touchdown run that would cement his name in football history. Some say this is what got Smith his Heisman, but in reality, he had an all-around spectacular season with a good team to back him up. In his senior year, he was awarded the Heisman Trophy, basically the Oscar of American football. This shot Bruce Smith to national fame. It was in 19, I think it was 1941. Uh, they traveled by train. They were going down to Iowa to play the Iowa Hawkeyes. And the high school here found out that the train was going to stop in Faribault, and they wanted to meet. They were going to send the band down, and about a thousand people down to the depot, and meet Bruce Smith, their hero from from Faribault, from the Gophers. Um, so they contacted the train company, and whatever the train's name was, I don't really know. Uh, the train did stop, but they stopped only to pick up Lucia Smith. They didn't have enough time to let Bruce get off and say anything to the band and the thousand people that were down by the depot. They came down, picked up Lucius, and left, left about a thousand people disappointed. 
He was asked to come to New York for a reception and give a simple speech on the radio. Two days before the speech, something happened. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Oh yeah. On the train ride to New York, Bruce realized he needed to change his speech in light of the recent tragedy. Rushing to complete it on time, Smith arrived in New York for his ceremony. On December 9th, 1941, Bruce Smith gave his revised speech, which emphasized the patriotism of football and how it represents young America's ability to get back up and keep fighting, to get back up from the depression and defend our nation. Smith was on the radio minutes before President Roosevelt gave his declaration of war against Japan. A frightened nation looked to the all-American football star for hope while waiting for their leader to retaliate against the actions that killed 2,500 American soldiers. Bruce enlisted in the Navy, staying for three years and spending some of that time as a football player for the Great Lakes Naval Station in Chicago and for the St. Mary's Flight School in California. Before that, however, he rode the gravy train to the mashed potatoes known as Hollywood. Smith of Minnesota came out in 1942 to rave reviews. Rave means bad, right? Smith of Minnesota. It was less than uh, a quality movie, I was told by some of the family members. In fact, his sister told me, she said, it just wasn't very good. So I'll take her word for it. So. <laughs> uh, Smith of Minnesota was about a small town, fair blue guy, obviously. His athletic career and what went on and went in service and was a hero. Um, maybe the family was being a little hard on them, but... Uh, uh, he played himself in the movie, so uh, Smith of Minnesota. Smith of Minnesota was Minnesota's first major movie premiere taking place here in Faribault. The story goes that locals laughed at advanced technologies like the telephones and electric streetlights that only major cities had at the time. After his one movie acting career and the war, Bruce turned his eye to professional footballing. I think the Packers and the Los Angeles Rams are the, for the two professional teams. So. Well, he got injured after playing a couple of years, and uh, it was, I think, a leg injury, and usually that makes it a pretty short career, and that's what happened to Bruce. So. Due to his injury, Bruce Smith stepped out of the limelight and into the lemon light. Please don't. He returned home to Minnesota, settle down, have a family. He married Gloria Bardot, a fashion model from Philadelphia he met while in the service. They had four children together. I know there's two boys. I've met two other boys, Scott and, and uh, Bruce Jr. They live up in the Alexandria and St. Cloud area. And I met both of them. Uh, very nice gentlemen. Very proud of their dad, obviously. We got in contact with Marvin Botke, whose mother had a close relationship with the Smith family. My name is Marvin Botke, and I live in the Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area. I grew up in Faribault and I remember visiting the Smith household quite often as a youngster with my mother. She would go back and visit them because she had been their nanny or live-in housekeeper as a young girl before she was married. My mother built a lasting relationship with the Smith family. Mrs. Smith always took an interest in our family and my mother would take me along sometimes when she would go visit the Smith family. My mother spoke of what seemed like a rather unusual practice at the time. I've since learned that it may have come from an old European lifestyle of long ago. Uh, as I recall, she said Wayne still drank from a baby bottle into the fourth grade, and when he would come home from school, she would have to fix a bottle for him. When my mother decided to leave the Smith family and get married, she introduced her sister Emma, Emma Schmidtke at the time, who later married Aaron Ross. and. Uh, she became the new live-in housekeeper or nanny for the Smith family after my mother left. And when I grew up and I married into the Rarick family, that was a name sort of synonymous with sports and Faribault and activities of that nature. My wife's uh, grandfather, George Rarick Sr., golfed, and he golfed very often with Lucius Smith at the old Shattuck golf course in Faribault. I recall seeing a large Wurlitzer organ in the Smith living room. It belonged to Wayne Smith, who became a dentist and also played the organ in church. I was just a youngster and I was fascinated looking at it and wished I could play it. Now that Smith had started settling down, he began working in several local businesses. In the 1950s, he worked in sales for a clothing store in Faribault and a beer distributor in Alexandria and he opened up a sporting goods store with a friend in Northfield. He was diagnosed with cancer in the spring of 1967 and died later that year. It was quite an unmiraculous death, but what he did with the last several months of his life show why this man deserves to be remembered. In the last several months of his life, 
Bruce Smith traveled with Father Cantwell, talking with cancer patients about life, hope, and the faith to not give up. Bruce Smith was a devout Catholic. He often prayed before games, and he discussed with his father that every man should spend at least an hour a day with God. Lucius was a strong factor in making Bruce the legend we know today. After his death, Father Cantwell nominated Bruce for sainthood. He didn't receive it, but there are murmurs of a campaign once again arising today. Bruce Smith certainly left a legacy in this town. Heck, we're standing on Bruce Smith Field right now. Father Cantwell uh, nominated him for sainthood, uh, which didn't happen and, and may or may not happen. But uh, Father Cantwell was his, maybe a mentor back then and helped him through his cancer and, until the end of his life. He thought he'd gone through so much. Just, uh, I'm not sure the requirements for sainthood, but he thought what he had gone for, through what he had done, and what he had meant to his life, he thought that was deserving of him being nominated. Well, he won the Heisman, which is the biggest award. He was named the Outstanding uh, uh, Athlete of the Year. I think he got that award in Chicago before he received the Heisman Trophy, uh, and his number retired. And, and I don't know how you can get any better awards than having winning the Heisman, having a number retired. That's pretty good, pretty special. Probably under just just the national championship. They were the national champs in 1441. Um, recognition is a big thing back then. And football was the king as far as college sports. So they received a lot of recognition just in name from being national champions. By the time this video comes out, A, the Minnesota Gophers should have won the Little Brown Jug, and B, a new mural for Bruce Smith should be up downtown, made by Dave Carell from Brushwork Signs. Bruce Crinky, as we said before, is on the Bruce Smith Golf Committee, which throws a golf tournament every year which raises money for Faribault schools. A friend of mine, Dave Henry, and I went up to the University of Minnesota, up to the Bierman building one day, and we saw a couple of busts of Bernie, or not of Bernie Bierman, but uh, Bronco Nagurski, former, a famous gopher. And we didn't see a bust of Bruce Smith. And I said, you know, there's only one Heisman Trophy winner, and there's nothing up here that, or it isn't enough to recognize him. And we started talking to football coaches, athletic directors about doing something. And we got people like Ivan Willock on board to create a bust with the help, help of the family. We've got sponsors that said, we'll help you get that all done. And it just kind of snowballed. It was just a wonderful project. It took me three or four years to get it all done. Very worthwhile project. It has made it special. And then being part of the Bruce Smith Golf Committee, having fun with uh, that name. And then we turn the money around and give it back to the schools in Fribble, high school, Bethlehem Academy, School for the Deaf. So we do something that's worthwhile under the name of Bruce Smith. I think it's important to learn about the history of Faribault. And if you learn about history, about Alexander Faribault, uh, Bishop Whipple, uh, maybe Bruce Smith should be part of that conversation as well. So yeah, I think so. Yeah. Bruce Smith exemplified the classic all-American image of strength, youth, and patriotism that was so common in those early industrial days of our nation. He was kind of like Captain America. Not only was he a skilled athlete, but he spent time serving the country in our darkest age. He showed a strong faith throughout the wartime and even as he suffered through cancer, remaining a beacon of hope till the end. He comforted others through both our country's greatest crisis and his fading health. Of all the things he stood for, he put it best himself on December 9, 1941, when he addressed the nation. Those Far Eastern fellows may think that American boys are soft, but I have had and even have now plenty of evidence in black and blue to show that they are making a big mistake. I think America will owe a great debt to the game of football when we finish this thing off. It keeps millions of American youngsters like myself hard and able to take it and come back for more, both from the physical standpoint and that of morale. It teaches team play and cooperation and eggs us on to go out and fight hard for the honor of our school and likewise the same spirit can be depended on when we have to fight like slaves to defend our country. Logan and I would like to thank our families because we forgot to do that last time. And of course, Bruce Crinky and Marvin Gabotke for those amazing interviews. We'd like to thank Carl Ludwig for explaining to us what quarterbacks say before they say hike. 
And be sure to tune in next month as we talk about Congressional Gold Medal recipient and veteran of the Women Air Force Service Pilots, Liz Strophus. If you have any history suggestions, questions, or say, hey, you got that fact wrong, you can email us at 1855 Faribault at gmail.com. See you then.